Good morning. If you got your Bible with you, I invite you to open up to Genesis chapter 2. That's where we're going to begin our study together in just a few moments. Genesis chapter 2. Thank you so much for being here this morning. I'm encouraged by your presence. I know that others are as well. And certainly our God is pleased with us gathering together today to glorify Him, to praise His Son, and to lift up each other. When I first started preaching, I was around 16 years old. My grandmother was still alive. Both of my grandmothers were still alive. And my maternal grandmother who uh, was married to a preacher, gave me some advice. She said, always know your outline and always know your audience. And she told me a story back when she was going to college in Tennessee. Way, way, way back in the day. And there was a young man who got up to preach one morning, and it was his first sermon to ever preach. And as preachers are sometimes wont to do, he had borrowed an outline from an older preacher. And he was preaching at this small little country Tennessee church, probably 40 or 50 people in it, real small building. And he began the sermon by greeting everyone that was in attendance. We have such a wonderful crowd today. And thank you to those of you who are joining us in the balcony this morning. And of course, that little church building didn't have a balcony. But that's what the outline said. And that's what the young man read. That stuck with my grandmother. Then there was another story along those lines that she told. But there was a young man who was preaching on a Mother's Day. Young man who was not married, one of his first sermons. He didn't really know what to say about mothers, and so he went to an older preacher and asked for an outline. Older preacher gave it to him. Now remember what we talked about earlier, rule number one, know your outline. This preacher, young man, thought he could he could do it without the outline. So he got up there on this Mother's Day sermon. And I don't know if the sermon he borrowed was from J.W. McGarvey, but it makes it all the better if he did borrow it from J.W. McGarvey. He got up and said, in his introduction to the Mother's Day sermon, the best years of my life were spent in the arms of another man's wife. And he forgot the rest of the quote. Now, the rest of the quote is, I spent the best years of my life in the arms of another man's wife, my mother. He forgot that. Know your outline, know your audience. But in that, there's some truth, isn't there? There's some truth about mothers. There's something special about a mother. And on a day like this, where our society tends to turn their focus towards mothers... There's certainly nothing wrong with us doing that today, seeing as mothers are something given to us by God. It's not just human experience that teaches us that mothers are significant. I want you to notice with me as we go through the pages of God's Word the significance of a mother. And looking at the significance of a mother, maybe in some passages where we wouldn't necessarily expect to go. We might expect to go to Proverbs 31, and we may end up there at some point today. Uh, we're, we're going to start here in Genesis chapter 2, but we're not going to spend a whole lot of time there. But we're going to look at some passages, maybe some unexpected passages, where we see God speak to us about mothers and motherhood and the significance of a mother and try to gather some thoughts then from these passages. But hopefully you're there with me in Genesis chapter 2. We're seeing the major and the minor. We kind of need to define our terms at the outset here. 
When we're talking about seeing the major, we need to understand that the home is, is the earliest of the institutions that God has ordained. We sometimes talk about God's three institutions that he has, uh, that he has created. You've got the home, you've got civil government, and you've got the church. The earliest out of those, of course, is the home. Fashioned here in Genesis chapter 2, in verse 21, because Adam did not have a helper comparable to him, the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And God took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in that place. The Lord fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man, and the man said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man for this reason. Verse 24, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. Both fathers and mothers play a significant role in the advancement of humanity. And I don't think it takes too deep of a look at society around us to see that as we have seen the breakdown of the home, we have seen a breakdown in society as well. God certainly knew what he was doing when he placed a father and a mother in a home and gave them specific roles and specific obligations. But one thing that that, that family does, and that these different roles in a family do, is that they help us better understand spiritual realities. Because over and over again in His Word, God uses these different familial relationships to express spiritual realities to us. For example, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 8, when Jesus is teaching His disciples how to pray, to whom does He tell them to direct their prayers? Our whom? Our Father who is in heaven. And we spoke just a bit about this. I think it was last week. But if we have an experience in our lives where, where we have a father in the home that we cannot rely on, where we have a father that does not care for us and act like he's supposed to, doesn't that make it a little bit different later in life to come to trust a God who is pictured to us as a father if our only experience with fatherhood is a negative one? Again, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 8, Therefore do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. But pray then in this way, verse 9, Our Father who art in heaven. We learn a spiritual truth about the nature of God and the usage of this family language. Jesus is described as our brother. For this reason, He is not ashamed to call them brethren writer of Hebrews says in chapter 2 and verse 11. Or we have this language of, of, of a wife or a bride used in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 31 to communicate to us the relationship of Christ and the church, a husband and a wife. But this morning we want to talk about mothers, and that is our major. But we're going to see the major, the idea of motherhood, in the minor, some perhaps obscure passages. And perhaps obscure might not be the right word. Perhaps it might be less renowned passages. Passages that we might not think of to be referencing motherhood, but in reality have a great deal to say about that. For example, what Colby read for us this morning, flip over to Matthew chapter 23. In Matthew chapter 23, we have Jesus Uh, wrapping up really just his exposure of the scribes and the Pharisees as hypocrites. Uh, He has laid them bare. He has exposed them for who they are and what they are and the many ways in which they were lacking in their service to God. And he's about to, in chapter 24, discuss what was going to happen to Jerusalem as a result of that hypocrisy that all of the people had bought into. But just before transitioning into that discussion, as you look here at Matthew chapter 23, Jesus says in verse 34, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes, 
Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. That upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Barakai, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, verse 37. The one who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her. How often I wanted to gather you together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. As Jesus talks here about the destruction that would come upon Jerusalem, he invokes the language of a mother. And even if we aren't familiar with this in our own lives for some reason, we're familiar with this in in just popular media, right? You have the doting motherly figure that we see over and over again, even in cartoons when we were little. This motherly role. And here Jesus invokes that very idea. He offered protection to the Jews. How often I would have gathered you together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings to warm them, to protect them from the enemy, to protect them from outside conditions. But what was the problem? You were not willing. It wasn't that Jesus was unwilling to help them. It wasn't that God was unwilling to help them. It wasn't that the Holy Spirit was unwilling to help them. It was that they were unwilling to accept Jesus. And because they refused to accept Jesus, they refused the protection that Jesus offered them just as a hen would gather her chicks under her wings. And because they rejected him, that would lead to the destruction of their nation. Your house is left to you desolate, or in chapter 24 and verse 15, when you see the abomination that makes desolate, spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, and that those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Destruction was coming because they refused Jesus. They refused the protection that he offered, the salvation that was his to give. Jesus offered, though, just exactly what a mother offers, selfless help. When we picture a mother, when we picture what God would design a mother to be, here's one of those qualities. Just absolutely selfless help. Some of us were blessed to experience this in our lives, weren't we? Did you ever wait until the night before a science fair project and let mom know, hey, By the way, I need to make a plaster of Paris mold of the moon. I mean, I'm not speaking in specifics because of anything that might have happened in my life. Or, Mom, I'm hungry. It's 11 o'clock at night, and I know you're sleeping, but I'm hungry. Of course, you don't go in and tap Mom on the shoulder and tell her, do you? No, when you're seven or eight years old, what do you do? You just go and stand over your mom until she senses something and wakes up and there's your face just staring right at her. I'm glad I'm not the only one again. Just this absolutely selfless help. And and, and we don't realize it at the time, do we? We absolutely do not realize it at the time, just how absolutely selfless our moms can be and have been. then we get older and we appreciate it more and hopefully we have time to express that appreciation and to receive help that is so much more significant than science fair projects and chicken nuggets Because the kind of selfless help we see Jesus giving is the kind of selfless help that a good mother absolutely gives her children. And it's that spiritual guidance and direction. In John chapter 12 and verse 32, 
Jesus said, And I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death with which he was to die. You talk about selfless help. You see it in Jesus. You see it in mothers. The multitude said to him, We have heard out of the law that the Christ is to remain forever, and how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Jesus therefore said to them, For a little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light, that the darkness may not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light in order that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and hid himself from them. Greatest help we could ever receive. We see coming from Jesus. And that same kind of selfless help. This picture is coming from mothers. Something we ought to be appreciative for. And if I'm a mother, something I ought to be orienting myself towards. But how about this? Let's look at another passage. Stay there in Matthew. Go back to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. Very, very early in your New Testament. Matthew chapter 2, we have Jesus, verse 1, being born. And we've got Herod instituting his slaughter. In verse 16, when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he became very enraged. And he sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its environs from two years old and under, according to the time which he had ascertained from the Magi. Then that which was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. The story here of Jesus, or Matthew rather, recounting uh, an episode early in the life of Jesus. Herod doesn't get all of the information that he wants from the Magi. And so he begins a slaughter of all of Bethlehem's baby boys. Give Herod credit, and he seems to have put the pieces together, much like the Magi had, about the king who was going to be born, and Herod views him as a threat. And so he's going to slaughter all the male children, two years old and under, in Bethlehem to try to rid himself of what he views as this threat to his throne and to his power. And though Jesus himself is not caught up in this slaughter... Matthew goes back to the words of Jeremiah and uses those words from Jeremiah to describe what happened. Flip over to Jeremiah 31. I want you to notice this with me. Jeremiah 31. In Jeremiah 31 and verse 1, at that time declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. Israel, when it went to find its rest. So we're focusing on Israel. Israel finding grace from God after persecution. But I want you to come over here to to verse 8. Behold, I am bringing them from the north country. I will gather them from the remote parts of the earth. Among them the blind and the lame, the woman with child, and she who is in labor with child together, a great company. They will return here with weeping. They will come, and by supplication I will lead them. I will make them walk by the streams of water on a straight path in which they will not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare in the coastlands afar off, and say, He who scattered Israel will gather him. And keep him as a shepherd his flock, for the Lord has ransomed Jacob and redeemed him from the hand of him who was stronger than he. Now skip down to verse 15. Thus says the Lord, a voice is heard in Ramah. Ramah was in Benjamin. Uh, One of uh, Benjamin, of course, being part of the southern kingdom of Judah. 
A voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. But Rachel has been dead for thousands of years perhaps now. Well, it's a figure of speech, right? The connection there with Benjamin. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Of course, verse 16 brings in hope. Thus says the Lord, restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work will be rewarded, declares the Lord, and they will return from the land of the enemy. What's going on here in the book of Jeremiah? What's about to happen? Southern kingdom is going off into captivity, aren't they? Serve the king of Babylon for 70 years, but afterwards God is going to bring them out. And he talks here about them coming back with mourning and with tears and with weeping. What's going to happen in the book of Ezra? In Ezra chapter 2, Ezra chapter 3, when they finally return to the land, what do the old men do when they return and see the foundation of the temple relay? The old men wept. Matthew borrows in Matthew 2 the language of Jeremiah. This language referencing Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. There is a unique nature. A mother's love for her children. At least that's God's design, isn't it? God's design is this unique bond with a mother and her child. God will use this language to describe his relationship with Israel even earlier. How could he forget them? A nation that nursed just like a baby. My wife and I have been talking about kind of some of the challenges that come about with our present situation right now and waiting on a house to get built and a new baby coming and all of that. But the reality is, at this time in my baby's life, yeah, there's a role for me to play. But at one month old, there's not a whole lot daddy can do, is there? Besides help mama. And I can change diapers, I can, I can soothe and play with the baby. But for nearly every one of those baby's needs, who's there to fulfill it? Mama is. Mama's there. Mama's there feeding the baby. Mama's there washing the baby. Mama's there taking care of the baby. She's got that baby Bjorn on, and everywhere she's going in the house, that baby's right there because baby's in that stage where baby's got to be next to mama. Now, here's the reality. Not everybody has that experience. Not everybody has that experience with a mama. If you had that experience, you'd be thankful to God you did. And if you did have that experience, you encourage others to be what you had. And maybe you didn't have that. You can be it for somebody. You can be there for somebody. You may say, it doesn't come naturally to me. That's okay. It can. That's why God gives us these instructions here. There's this unique nature of a mother's love for her child that we see referenced over and over again in Scripture. And so the question for us is, do I embrace this love? As a mother, do I embrace this love? Do I give my children what is most important? Do I nourish them? Do I... Do I clothe them? Do I prepare them for life? Do I as a mother live in such a way that when my children grow older and look at me, they'll see not only me, they'll see Jesus? Or how about as a father or as a child, do I appreciate this love? And especially as a husband and especially as a father, do I encourage this kind of behavior? And this kind of relationship in my wife. We need to embrace this kind of love. Our society is bereft of it in so many ways. We need to embrace this. We need to 
We need to make sure it's there in our lives and we need to make sure that we're encouraging it. And look at this passage with me. Go back in your Old Testament to the book of Psalms. Kind of an unusual passage to look at. I want you to turn over to the 35th Psalm. Psalm 35. Sometimes we have Psalms of Thanksgiving. Sometimes we have Messianic Psalms, Psalms that point us to the Messiah. Uh, sometimes we have Psalms of reorientation. We, we, we get in a bad way. We have this kind of moment of epiphany. The light bulb goes off. And then we, we make these adjustments and, and we have this time of reorientation. Uh, Asaph. Uh, I was, my feet had stumbled. I had nearly slipped when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Um, God, are, are you going to take care of the righteous? And, and Asaph is all upset about this until I went into the house of the Lord and then I understood their end. There's this epiphany moment. And this moment of reorientation for Asaph. That's Psalm 73, I think. But we're in Psalms 35. And what can be called an imprecatory psalm? These, these are those uncomfortable psalms in the book. Psalms where the writer is calling down for God's justice on one's enemies. Psalm 35 and verse 1, Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of buckler and shield and rise up for my help. Draw also the spear and the battle axe to meet those who pursue me. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Let those be ashamed and dishonored who seek my life. Let those be turned back and humiliated who devise evil against me. Let them be like chaff before the wind with the angel of the Lord driving them on. Let their way be dark and slippery with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. That doesn't sound like do unto others as you would have them do unto you, does it? But it's in the book, isn't it? And there's a reason for it. These imprecatory psalms that call down for God's what? God's justice. Because you have people who are arraying themselves not simply against David, not simply against the author of the psalm, but are arraying themselves against God in these imprecatory psalms. It's not just a call for personal vengeance. It's a call for God to be glorified over his enemies. And that's what you have going on here in Psalm 35. That's what you see going on in the rest of the imprecatory psalms. But come over here with me to verse 12. How do we know this isn't all about personal vengeance? Look at verse 12 with me. They repay me evil for good to the bereavement of my soul. But as for me, when they were sick, when my enemies were sick, when they were going through difficulty, when they were going through a hard time, what did I do? Psalm 35, verse 13, as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I mourned for them. I prayed for them. This is reminiscent of Jesus' language that we don't return evil for evil, but we return good for evil. That we do good to those who do evil to us. Same kind of thing going on here. As for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer kept returning to my bosom. I went about, verse 14, I went about as though it were my friend or brother. I bowed down mourning as one who sorrows for a mother. Now, verse 15, but at my stumbling they rejoiced and gathered themselves together. The smiters whom I did not know gathered together against me. They didn't have that same care for me. But go back to verse 14. Here's David describing, describing how he prayed for his enemies. And describing how their ungodly behavior affected him. I went about as though it were my friend or brother. I bowed down mourning as one who sorrows for a mother. Here's a reality. While days like today are a joy for so many of us, for others of us, days like today are a heavy burden. 
Because either we remember what we never had, or we remember what we no longer have. And we may celebrate today with flowers, and we may celebrate today by going out to a restaurant and waiting four hours for a table. And we may get flustered at that kind of stuff. And then there are others of us who would die to have that moment. Who would give just about anything to be able to have one more conversation. One more visit. One more call. One more conversation. Because there's something special or something poignant about the loss of a mother. Particularly a mother who comes in God's design. And that's just exactly what the psalmist references here. We're seeing all of these different pictures of motherhood in these different passages. There, there's a very raw description of that bond here in Psalm 35 and verse 14. As one who sorrows for a mother. Could I submit to you that, that if that's the pain that we feel today, Could I submit to you that even in that cloud of darkness there's a blessing? And it's because we can look on a person like that favorably. Like we said earlier, there's a lot of people, maybe even here this morning, who, who can't look on a mother with feelings of peace and thankfulness and joy. But for those of us who can, even in the midst of sorrow, can we find an opportunity to be thankful to God for what He's given us? For the ways that He's blessed us? And for the wisdom of His plan? So what do we do with all of this? I need to be thankful for the godly mothers in my life. Thankful to those women for their godly choices. Because let's be honest, godly mothers don't just happen. Doesn't just happen. Sometimes we almost get that, get that idea in our heads, right, that we're just kind of waiting for this divine bolt of lightning to hit us and bang, change us, and then we're going to be what God wants us to be. But that's not how it happens, is it? God is willing to change us, yes, but He's going to change us through His Word and through His influence. And God's not going to drag us kicking and stream, screaming into conformity with His will. So for those who have made godly choices in their lives, I'm going to be thankful. I'm going to be thankful to the husbands and the fathers that supported them. I am fully aware of the reality that I'm a male and a husband and a father. But I think I'm pretty safe in saying that being a mom isn't always the easiest job that there is. But I'm thankful that there are people who are willing to do that job. And people who are willing to do it well. And we find room to be thankful to God for the wisdom of His design. But as we said earlier, the sad reality is that not everyone has a positive experience with their mother. And sometimes the, the, the wisdom of God's design seems lost upon us in individual moments because we can look back and see, well, my mom wasn't this, my mom wasn't that, my mom didn't do that. And, and how do we handle that? i tell you this, when I went to college... 
I didn't have the normal college experience. You know, getting down somewhere and, you know, kind of breaking free of all chains and becoming your own person and doing your own thing and living your own life. I didn't get that. I traded in having one mom for having about seven different moms at the church that I attended. A couple of elders' wives, a few deacons' wives, and then just some older widow ladies there in the church. Who anywhere that I went in town, I ended up seeing somebody. Anything that I did in town, I ended up seeing one of them. Folks who were always checking up on me. Here's the reality. It doesn't have to be a biological relationship for me to have a godly mother. Or for you to be a godly mother. Or for that matter to be a godly husband, father, anything like that. It doesn't have to be blood. Remember what Paul called Timothy? My son. Don't have to have that blood relationship, that biological relationship, to have what God has designed or to be what God wants us to be. And whatever my, my role is, I either need to live out God's plan for godly motherhood or I need to encourage it. I need to make sure I give my wife the support that she needs. Ephesians chapter 5. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. I need to be self-sacrificial. I need to be nurturing and cherishing just like Paul will say at the very end of that text. I need to make sure that if I prize godly motherhood, I need to be the husband that is there supporting my wife saying, what do you need? I'm here to help you because I recognize that your role is significant. I need to give my wife the support that she needs. I need to share wisdom with younger mothers. Titus chapter 2, older women teach the younger women to love their husbands, to love their children. You know what God does here? God recognizes the reality that some of us are not going to have that positive experience and aren't going to be able to know in a practical, experiential way what godly motherhood is because I didn't have that godly mother. And so what does God do? Older women teach the younger women. Show them what it is. Show them what godly motherhood actually is. Show them how to love their children, how to love their husbands, to be what God wants them to be. And I need to convince myself of the unique privilege and role of motherhood. Our society just would crumple this up like a piece of paper and toss it away. God sees it as something significant. See, that means pay attention because this point is important. <laughs> right? God sees motherhood as something crucially important. We see it in the book of Matthew in chapter 23, Matthew chapter 2. We see it in Psalm 35. And we see it page after page after page in Scripture. God communicates truth about the spiritual realm to us through these foundational relationships we recognize in life. Even a mother. Jesus said, How often I would have gathered you together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. Let's make sure that we're willing. That we're willing to praise mothers that God has given us in His wisdom. That we're willing to serve in, in whatever capacity that God has given us. Most importantly, as we come to Matthew 23, let's make sure that we're willing to receive the protection and the hope and the salvation that Jesus offers. The best way to be the mother that God wants you to be or the best way to praise the mother in your life is to come to the one who created that very role and to throw yourself before him and to become what he wants you to be. And the first thing that God would tell us to do is to conform ourselves to the life of his son. Jesus would tell us to take up the cross and to follow after him. We need to turn to Jesus. 
We need to accept his offer of freedom and forgiveness and pardon. Find the hope that he gives. And finding that liberation from sin, we become slaves and servants of righteousness. Romans chapter 6. And have that moment of change at baptism. Rising to walk a new life. Conformed into the image of Christ. Fitting in whatever role Christ would give me as a wife, as a mother, as a husband, as a father, or simply as an encourager. If you look at your life this morning and you're outside of a relationship with God, Jesus shed his blood for you. And he's waiting for you to respond to it. Maybe as a Christian, you look at your life and you haven't been living as you should, and you want to change. We want to help you make that change. And if we can help you in any way, would you let us know by coming while we